Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast, a production of Catholic Answers. Hey everyone, I just wanted to thank you for your support of the podcast. I want to let you know that we're close to having 300 patrons, and as we get more and more patrons, we're going to be able to debut new content and do a lot of other great stuff with the podcast. So thank you so much for doing that. And because of your support, what we're going to try to do is actually expand the podcast. I want to do at least two episodes a week instead of one episode. Uh, So for this week, I mean, (laughs) there's been a lot going on, as you can imagine. So I want to share with you just some extra content. This is an interview that I did with Father Paul Cech when he served with the Courage Apostolate. We were talking about the Church and what the Church teaches on homosexuality, and I think that's very relative, it relates a lot to what's going on with the current scandals in the Church, which I will address on my next podcast. So I just wanted to share this extra content with you and let you know we're doing our best to increase the amount of great content to equip you to explain and defend the faith. So part one is available right here. If you'd like to hear the second part of this interview and other great content we're releasing, go to trenthornpodcast.com, become a subscriber for just even for $5 a month, you get access to tons of content like this. So Here's my interview with Father Paul Cech, and I hope you enjoy it. And today we're speaking with Father Paul Cech, who's the executive director of Courage International and a priest in the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And we're going to be focusing on uh, what for many people is a very tough issue, issues related to homosexuality, same-sex attraction, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. So, Father, welcome aboard. Trent, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm very happy to join you and to try to provide uh, some light and uh, peace uh, on exactly what you say, a very difficult and often painful topic for people. Sure. Well, first, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and the ministry that you're you're currently involved in, Courage? Mm. Well, I was ordained a priest in 1997, Mm -hmm. and I'm a late vocation. I spent nine years as an officer in the Marine Corps. Some people say... Father, how did you get from the Marine Corps into the priesthood? And uh, I like to say that the Marine Corps taught me a great deal about fatherhood because my Marines were my sons, and that was the model that I was taught and grew up with. So that actually was a a good beginning for the spiritual fatherhood of the priest. Um, I'm trained as a a parish priest, and it's certainly where uh, my experience uh, lies and where my heart is. But the Church asked me a number of years ago to take up a more specialized ministry, to a group of people who often feel estranged from uh, and perhaps even hated by the Catholic Church. And this ministry was founded in 1980 by the Cardinal Archbishop of New York at that time, Terence Cardinal Cook, who is now Servant of God, and he realized uh, in a very thoughtful way with the heart of the Good Shepherd that the Church must have something besides the word no to say to a group of people who are as much in the heart of Christ as anyone, as any of us. And so he began with Father John Harvey of Happy Memory, uh, an oblate of St. Francis de Sales, who had been working in this field for years, uh, a ministry called Courage, and the goals of Courage were actually formulated by uh, seven men, the original seven founders of Courage, you could say, in Lower Manhattan under Father Harvey and Cardinal Kirk's supervision. And uh, probably central to that, of course, is going to be the Church's teaching on chastity and then the fellowship in a support group, uh, which helps people to know not only that they're not alone, but there are very real ways, practical ways, in which we can help each other to understand the gospel and uh, to live it. Okay, so right now you're promoting a film called Desire of the Everlasting Hills. Yes. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit about the film, Mm -hmm. how it came about, and really what it's what its message is and its, and its purpose is. Sure. Well, uh, let's start this way. St. Thomas has a pedagogical principle. What is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. And maybe a simple example would be when you pour your coffee into the cup, it takes the shape of the cup. And with regard to the human soul and the, the intellect, uh, the way that we understand things is shaped by our experience and our education and relationships and so on. And the church, as she proclaims the good news, uh, relies very heavily, understandably, on uh, an understanding, a universal understanding of human nature. 
and to try to help people to understand, in this case, the church's teaching on chastity and sexual ethics. But unfortunately, uh, what is sometimes called the natural moral law is not the grammar of today. And so uh, to just try to explain the church's teaching from that standpoint, important as it is, and I believe we must, uh, will not reach many people. They won't understand it, and uh, they, they, they may say, well, uh, that, that doesn't have anything to do with me. So, so, it, so it's kind of like if you have the cup, uh, if it's whole, it'll take the liquid, but let's say the cup has a little hole in it. You, right. pour, the li- you pour liquid in, it's going to start spewing out, it can't hold it. Right. You're saying people have a difficult time understanding just strictly natural law philosophical arguments about the moral life. They, they can, they can. Uh, unless perhaps you reach for something egregious, like uh, all Jews are non-persons, mm-hmm. which of course is not true. But to say that to people causes them to draw back and say, how could you say that? You know, Jewish people are as much human as anyone else, which is of course right. But we're trying to make a point, which is to say we can make the claim that uh, Jews are persons and Catholics are persons and Buddhists are persons because we have a shared nature. We're all human. But even the persuasiveness of those arguments, I think, for many tends to break down when we enter into the sexual realm. Hmm. So we need another way. We need another way of trying to share what's true. And uh, I think we looked for some guidance on this from Christ himself in the gospel where he tells stories. He tells stories about people so that he can convey deep truths about humanity, uh, about God, about himself, about salvation. And some of these now, we call them the parables, have become idiomatic expressions like the prodigal son and the good Samaritan. Everybody knows what those means. Those are the greatest teaching tools, I think, of all time. And they're stories. Well, we said, look, let's tell stories too. Let's tell the stories of, in this case, three people who had a certain understanding of themselves and lived in a certain way, then had a change of heart, and now are living another way. And these stories are true stories. Uh, The people in the film that you've mentioned, Desire of the Everlasting Hills, are Courage members. Uh, They're not actors. We didn't write scripts of ideas. No, these people are just telling their stories. And I think in the culture in which we live, individual stories are valued. They may not always be understood, and of course, it's hard to say to someone, well, that's not your experience. I might not like it, but I can't gainsay someone's experience. We thought, look, let's use these uh, narratives, these stories, to convey the truths of humanity and the efficacy of grace and bringing us to a deeper understanding of our dignity. In this film, then, so you have uh, three individuals, I believe it's uh, two men and one one woman, experiencing almost a sort of autobiographical sharing yes. of their life and what they confronted with their same-sex attractions right. and also their uh, relationships and ideas towards the Catholic faith. Yes. Now, sometimes in the, the popular debates about the issue of homosexuality, both sides can get really heated, and we forget about the people in the yes. center who uh, are really struggling mm-hmm. with their desires and how they want to live. Well, I'd like to start off with a clip from the film— of one of the stars, uh, a gentleman named Dan, talking about what it was like when he first discovered that he had same-sex attractions. And so this is part of his testimony. Yeah, I, I, I imagine the worst-case scenario. There was that idea that this is like the, the untouchable subject. And if, if you're, you know, better to be a leper than to be attracted to guys, right? That was, a, I don't know where that came from or why I felt that, but I felt like there was nobody I could talk to about that at all. Certainly not my family, certainly not my pastor, certainly not my friends. But there, there's, a, there's a need to connect. You, you've got to get this out. And so, yeah, going online, right, that's the way to go. That's the way to, when the internet came when I was in college, you know, I could finally talk to somebody. I could finally connect. You know, and I remember Googling um, at one point, you know how Google suggestions, they pop up. I typed in, I am gay and, and then the Google suggestions came up. The first one at the time was, and I want a boyfriend. And the second one was, and I want to die. There were times, I think, I never was tempted to suicide or anything, but there were moments when, you know, I, I, I was like, well, death would, wouldn't, wouldn't be so bad. You know, I'd be free of all of this. So is this uh, typical or something that you've, you've seen with people who 
uh, have encountered same sex attraction and are struggling through with this is is this um if you have you seen this before oh i think it's widespread trend there's a sensitivity about this question about this uh aspect of the human condition that as far as i can see is quite unlike anything else i mean people have all sorts of difficulties and things they're trying to puzzle out about themselves and the question who am i i think this is uh about as difficult as it comes. And Dan was right. From a human perspective, there is such a need to want to talk and and share and understand through conversation in someone else's eyes. But when it is this sensitive and this personal and this painful, uh, that can inhibit people or impede them. And that's one of the reasons why, of course, the Courage Apostolate exists. It seems uh, that language is really important when we're, we're talking about this issue, either with those who are personally affected by it, mm-hmm. or just talking about it in the abstract when people talk about the church and about the issue of homosexuality. Um, how do we sensitively talk about something that can be so emotional? Mm-hmm. And what do you think are some of the mistakes people make with language when they talk about this issue. Right. Well, um, I'm not putting you on report, but just a moment ago, you used the phrase, someone who is struggling with same-sex attraction. And and I've said that many times too. And of course, there are a lot of people who would flare up at that and say, I'm not struggling with this. Um, This is who I am. And uh, therefore, there isn't any struggle. And so I, I understand that from the experiential standpoint. I do think we try to be as... Uh, careful and thoughtful as possible, again, following St. Thomas's principle uh, of how people hear things. It seems to me that particularly in, in, in the question of homosexuality, uh, starting off with the phrase the church teaches is probably not going to win the day and may even uh, stop up some ears, do you know? So we're looking for other ways to begin a conversation. I think the church is very thoughtful and prudent in wanting to avoid labeling people. My reading of uh, church documents, uh, as as this question has unfolded culturally in the last uh, 30 or so years, is that the church does not use the words homosexual or lesbian or gay as nouns to describe a type of person. I think that tends to reduce someone's identity to one facet of of who they are. I'm not trying to undervalue that, and I'm not uh, attacking anyone. I just want to say, look, the human person is much more rich and complex than simply the matter of sexual attraction. So we could say the homosexual inclination, uh, someone who has same-sex attraction, although I know that's not well received in other places, but I think it's a matter of justice and charity, and that's why I think the Church does it. Okay, so you're you're saying then that it's not wise, especially even for people who see the the moral wrong involved with homosexuality, use terms like saying people who are gay or people right. who are lesbians, because we're more than our, our sexual orientation or our yes. sexual behavior. Yes. Because if those things were to change, we we would still be who we are. So you're saying our identity is deeper than that. That's right. I think you said it very, very well. I don't want to go to war over language. If someone says to me, I'm gay, and this is sort of our first encounter, I'm not going to try to push them away from that uh, label uh, because I may lose them in the conversation. So we don't have to try to uh, address everything all at once. I would just like to suggest to someone a fuller context for either thinking about themselves or thinking about another person. I will take another step here, though, and suggest uh, something that uh, we'd like Catholics to think about as they consider vocabulary. The twofold expression of human nature is not heterosexuality and homosexuality. It's male and female. Mm -hmm. Years ago, St. Thomas, we've cited him before, would call that a self-evident principle. Today, perhaps not as self-evident. But I think that Genesis, our Lord himself, natural reason, indicate that to us. So I don't think we should say that the complements are homosexuality and heterosexuality, they're male and female. And so you're saying, so there are men and women, and we have these different desires and inclinations, and we need to sort through which um, are natural and which are good, 
and which are not and how to confront those. Well, even the word natural there. See, now this is something I've learned uh, right. by stepping in potholes. <laughs> and I've stepped in a lot of them in, in the 10 years I've been working in this field. Someone on the other side of the discussion might say, look, these feelings are very natural to me. I didn't seek them out. They've been with me as far as back as I can remember. They come naturally to me, so don't tell me they're not natural. Okay, I understand that. There, there could be some confusion again about, about language. Here, I think the way you're using the term natural is to say what is proper to uh, human nature in the sense of leading that nature to its fulfillment whether it's uh, sexually or another way. Yeah, let's go into that just a, a little bit deeper before we look at another clip from the documentary. You, you'll hear a lot, I'm sure you've heard a lot of people say this, look, Father, I or my friend or you know my sister, my uncle, my cousin, they didn't choose this, mm-hmm. they were born this way, mm-hmm. uh, and using this sense of natural, this is how I've always felt, right. I was born this way, or mm-hmm. why would God make me this way? Right. How do you respond when when people uh, put it to you that way? Well, uh, I would never challenge someone's experience. I mean, if someone says, as far back as I can remember, I've had these feelings. And and I I think we can take that as true, uh, that their memory is accurate. Um, But I think that's not quite the same thing as saying that someone's born that way. I think psychologists tell us that memory maybe goes back to the age of three or four something like that. So it certainly doesn't go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, But we might try to look at this from a couple of different perspectives. And in no way am I trying to demean anyone or or be funny or um, uh, not approach this question with a kind of reverence and dignity. But I might propose something like this. I could say, as far back as I can remember, I'm an English speaker. That is my memory of my experience. Now, quite clearly, I didn't come out of the womb speaking English. But I heard things, and I made certain choices, not with the full volitional character or quality that I have as an adult, or anyone does, but I did make some choices as I was young, and I started to pattern my speech after what I heard. Now, I'm not jumping real quickly to the nature-nurture argument. I'm only saying that as we set out to understand ourselves, we should think carefully about how choices that we have made change us, whether for the good or for not. And those choices have something to do with carving out our identity. What I would say here also is that the initial attraction erotically to a member of the same sex in most cases probably does arise unbidden. In other words, someone isn't summoning this, or they're not choosing those attractions from the start. It just happens. Yeah, in a sense, it just happens. Now, what they do with them after that, as true of all of us with things that arise uh, unbidden, there now we have this question of uh, how the choice is going to inform the identity. Uh, But I think that's a very important piece, because we don't want to fail to understand that what brings someone to their understanding of themselves, may include things over which they did not have control and for which they are not responsible. Sexual abuse, for instance, right. uh, which can disfigure anyone's understanding, not just of the sexual act, but of themselves. And quickly, I'm not drawing a straight line of causality from sexual abuse to homosexuality. I'm just using that as an example to say something might affect someone deeply Mm -hmm. if they were abused as a child about how they understand themselves. Right. But we're not saying everyone who experiences same-sex attractions is victim abuse. Yeah, that that psychology and our attractions, they can be be complicated. But I I think when this comes up, people say, I was born this way, or, you know, I've always felt this way. I think a lot of Catholics may respond with a very poor analogy. They may Mm -hmm. say, well, some people have pedophilic or desires to have relations with children as long as they can remember. And I think that instantly sets up a landmine because people think that you're comparing. Do you think it could be something more along the lines of saying, well, as long as I can remember, I've always had a short fuse Mm -hmm. or a temper, and this is just who I am. We would still say, well, even if that's what you've always known yeah. doesn't mean it's something you always have to pour yourself into. Uh, sure. An, uh, an inclination can be misdirected as well as being directed to its proper fulfillment. And we know that in the in the sexual realm, our inclinations can be misdirected in any one of a number of ways. And we have to just guard against that because we don't want to hurt someone else and we don't want to hurt ourselves. 
and as Christians, we don't want to give offense to God. Uh, even the word desire, which I think we've already used here, is probably a word that we have to look at carefully because desire has a volitional quality to it, or it can. So even keeping it as neutral as possible, inclination. When you say volitional, you mean the will. The like will you're is involved. Choosing I'm, to I'm do making something. a choice. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I'm making a choice. Attraction and inclination are probably as neutral mm-hmm. as we can use. Uh, desires can suggest I'm making a choice for something. Okay, well, what I want to do now is I want to play another clip from the film. And this is where Dan, he talks to us a little bit how after engaging this inclination, the same-sex attraction, how he ended up rejecting his faith because of it. So let's let's take a listen. There's this basilica in town, a basilica de St. Adelbert. That represented God to me, how he didn't really love me, how he just was this brutal little puppet master and, and who said, you're going to live this life, and I don't care about your happiness at all, because that's the way I felt. And you know what? You've got to obey me just because I say so. And so every time I drove by, I, I'd see it, and I'd just become seething with anger, and I would just fly at the bird every time. You know, I don't know what people would think if they were driving by me, but I'd lean over and <clears throat> do that every single time for, for a couple years. There's no way that he loved me. There was no way that his plans were to prosper me and harm me. I thought, you're a liar. I wanted him dead. I think from from time to time, you'll you'll hear people say the church, it needs to be welcoming to Mm -hmm. people who identify as being gay or lesbian so that they won't leave. So how do we help people like Dan, someone who was in Dan's shoes at that time, understand what the church really teaches about homosexuality without just being just repelled, basically. Well, the point that you're raising here, Trent, is very good because for a lot of people, not just on the question of homosexuality, but probably sexual ethics more generally speaking, a lot of people regard the church as the impediment Mm. to happiness and the obstacle to freedom, which is, of course, terribly and painfully ironic Uh, because the church is really the defender and the champion of human fulfillment, joy, and uh, and peace uh, that comes through using our freedom well. I think it comes, to answer your question more directly, it seems to me relationships are indispensable in this area. Let's go to an example from the gospel that does touch the question of sexual ethics. I'm thinking of John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, a mutual human need, thirst, a need for water, uh, gives rise to a conversation uh, between two people. And the conversation, of course, and how it can unfold is understood by one of them, because he's God, Jesus Christ. Uh, But he understands uh, that the woman with whom he's speaking comes to the conversation with a perspective that will be helpful in building a relationship. So he starts to talk with her about something that she's interested in, which is God, uh, things divine. And from that conversation of the mutual human need and now mutual interest in in matters divine, the, the relationship starts to build. And he talks with her about grace, how we share the life of God, and how eternal life begins by the living water welling up within us unto uh, life eternal. And all of those things have very much captured her attention and her heart and her imagination. And then he gets to the question of how she's living. So he hasn't begun with the question of the morality of a way of living sexually, but he hasn't avoided it either. And one of the, I think, most beautiful aspects of this encounter that our Lord has with the Samaritan woman is what happens on the other side of it and how she testifies to the relationship of trust which they built. Here's a man who took an interest in me, who knew things about me, who spent time with me, who told me things about myself, she says, and then she becomes an apologist herself. That relationship that they established, that Jesus was careful to uh, build with her, becomes the platform uh, for a conversation ultimately about how she's living, and she doesn't deny that she's at cross purposes with what else is important to her, If we don't build relationships with people, then I think we have a much more difficult time trying to persuade them of what might be a sterile, severe, harsh, 
uh, teaching on the part of the Catholic Church. So I think we could see maybe that the two wrong approaches maybe share something in common in that they, they don't build up that relational element. There would be the, the, the harsh end, which is just saying, oh, you're gay and you're lesbian, you don't have a, a place here. Mm-hmm. Or the the other approach that compromises truth and says, right. well, you can be gay, you can be lesbian, and, and God loves you, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter what you do. Yes. What you seem to be saying is, well, no, we're not defined by those terms, which is why we shouldn't say you are gay, you are lesbian, you are right. whatever. Right. You are a person made in the image of God with certain inclinations or attractions, just as we all have. Mm-hmm. And I am a person, and we are two people who should lead one another to God, and you're saying there's not that quick fix, it's that walking in that relational path. And that's something that I think uh, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has talked about very engagingly when he talks about accompaniment. Uh, Jesus does lead the apostles, but he's also accompanying them for three years, and as ministers of the gospel, uh, priests are to do the same, and then according to the universal priesthood, uh, priesthood of the baptized, we all have that uh, disposition by grace, to accompany and to walk with someone out of charity and not insisting that they reach a certain level of understanding or acceptance right away. Uh, Our Lord himself doesn't do that as he is uh, building up an understanding with the apostles. He doesn't begin with Calvary. Mm, That comes later, still very sharp and hard for them, but there's sort of a pedagogy there that is very useful for us to think about. Let's go to another section from John's Gospel, Trent, that I think will embody the things that you've mentioned here. Uh, This time it's John 8 and the woman caught in unchastity adultery. Everyone knows the section well. And once the people who have bad intentions have melted away because our Lord has exposed those bad intentions as they have tried to oppose him to Moses. Uh, Moses told us this is what we should do when we catch people like this. What do you say? And he indicates the one without sin can cast the first stone. Now he's talking, now he's back in in building a relationship with an individual person, and he says, does anyone condemn you? No, sir, no one condemns me. And he says, well, I don't condemn you either. There's the compassion of the God-man for fallen human nature, and in a particular way, that vulnerability that we have to sexual sin, because we want to be loved, and we want to love, and we want the fulfillment of the heart, and so we, are, we can be very vulnerable there. But we know that that passage continues, now go and do not commit this sin again, that's the call to conversion. I think if we're going to be faithful to Christ, we have to have in equal measures compassion, which is based on the truth, and the call to conversion of heart. If we are immoderate one way or the other, we're going to lose the fullness of the teaching. It's interesting that in the Pope Emeritus' last encyclical, he makes the distinction between sentimentality and compassion. Mm-hmm. They, they can look very similar, but sentimentality is not uh, undergirded by the truth. I think we live in a very sentimental culture. Uh, and it refers to what you were saying uh, before about come in and you're accepted as you are and all so of that. So sentimentality is just, I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. But compassion is something very different. Yes, I don't want to hurt someone's feelings or I don't want them to be angry at me or some other motive, a part of which is very good. I mean, sentimentality has an attractiveness because there's just enough good in it to be uh, attractive to us. But compassion is grounded in the truth of our humanity and then in the truth of the gospel and and the work of grace. Let's talk about an objection I think a lot of people have to this particular teaching. And it usually goes something like this. They'll say, if two people aren't hurting one another Mm -hmm. and they love each other, then I have a hard time seeing what the big deal is. And you'd probably say that the the problem here is we're operating on two very different moral planes or two different two very different views of what makes things right or wrong. So Mm -hmm. how would you respond to this this kind of attitude? In the Summa Contra Gentiles, uh, St. Thomas, in defining sin, says that we don't commit a sin, that is to say, we don't offend God, which is what sin is, part of the definition of sin. He says, we don't commit a sin except insofar as we do harm to ourselves. Mm. So when people hear the word sin today, and St. John Paul II quoting Pope Pius XII said, the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin, Mm -hmm. and I think there's a, a lot to be said for that. Uh, When people hear the word sin, even Catholics, they tend to think of something that's happening outside of me, uh, that has, you know, has left me somehow, and that doesn't really affect me, especially after I've forgotten about it. But 
let me be a simple example can can indicate why that's not the case. Let's take the example of lying. If I lie to you, I've done you a disservice, uh, injustice, and a disservice to the truth. But the first effect of the lie is in me. For that moment that I told a lie, I made my will evil, and I become, in some measure, a liar. And that's bad for me. So St. Thomas's point is to say that all sin has that character of self-inflicted harm or wound, and that's why God hates sin, because it damages or destroys the thing that he loves the most, which you know, his children. And I think that's hard because some people think when we say, oh, that's a sin, it's just, oh, well, it's just making an arbitrary God angry and he doesn't like it. Right. Or it's something that the church has fabricated that a man in a white casket who lives 4,000 miles away has just, as you say, arbitrarily determined that Catholics should not use contraception for But really for God gets angry at sin because it hurts the children he loves. Exactly. And I think that's the point. When we think about sin, we have to think about it in terms of the damage that it does to something better, someone that is precious to God. And how precious? He poured out his life on the cross. Thanks, guys, for listening to that interview and for your support that allows us to do extra content each week. We're hoping to stick to a schedule of two episodes a week instead of one. And if you want to hear the second part of this episode, become a subscriber for as little as $5 a month at trenthornpodcast.com. Thanks a lot. If you like today's episode, become a premium subscriber at our Patreon page and get access to member-only content. For more information, visit trenthornpodcast.com.